In this time, we are separated physically, and yet we are together in spirit. And so we invite you to prepare for worship in your home with a candle or electric light, a Bible, and something you can share during communion, such as crackers and juice or bread and water, uh, so that we can break bread and share cup and remember our Lord together. By the Sea of Galilee, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, do you love me? Let's begin our worship this morning by telling the Lord, oh, we do, we love you. We will sing together, oh, how I love Jesus, my Jesus, I love thee, and I love you, Lord. Let's be sure our Lord gets the message. Let's sing together. with us, some good oldies. Would you respond with me, uh, actually read with me, our responsive call to worship this morning. God calls us out of our isolation to join spirits with our sisters and brothers in this community of faith. Rejoice, Rejoice for, for God, God is among us. us. God calls us out of our confusion to speak to us from the word and to inspire us by the spirit. Rejoice, Rejoice for, for the, the spirit, spirit surrounds us. God calls us out of our sorrow to fill us with new hope and purpose through the powerful love of Jesus. Rejoice, Rejoice for, for Christ, Christ is with, with us. People, People of God, God come, let, let us worship, worship together. together. And our opening hymn, When Morning Gilds the Skies. <laughs>
You know, I don't know much about fishing. In fact, I've only been a few times in my life, but I do feel like I know what it's like to drag a sad, empty net around the house all day, longing for the olden days when kids could visit with their friends at school in person and grandparents could feel the chub of the thigh of their newborn baby. Ah, sweet times. So when I find myself struggling into the night or dragging around too long, I realize I need to get right. I need to look up and out and to Jesus and listen for how to fish another way. It's during my times in Zoom rooms, whether Monday meetings with a creative staff, adult studies where people are eager to share and learn together, family laughing about how terrible everybody's hair looks, or our precious children who I have the privilege to meet with at 3.30 on Thursdays, where we share our joys and concerns for the week. It's then that I realize the joy that we actually can be connected in this way. Even if we are flat on each other's screens, we still get to meet face to face, right? Now that's joy overflowing for sure. My cold computer screen suddenly beams with faces of wonder and light and brightness, full of life and hope. God's people filling one square after the next. Now, how's that for a good day of fishing? Looking up and following Jesus and Jesus' way really does change everything. Let's pray together as we zoom then on today's scripture reading. Dear Lord, thank you for coming to us when we're dragging. Thank you that we can bring all our concerns and joys to you. Help us keep our eyes on you and on the many joys you give us daily so that we can overflow in sharing your love with others. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, We will go with you. They went out and got into the boat. But that night they caught just after daybreak he stood on the beach, but this but the disciple did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net to the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because there are so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in a boat dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from land, only about a hundred yards off when they have gone ashore. They saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of your fish that you had just caught. Uh, so Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish and a hundred and fifty-three of them, and though there were so many, the net was not torn. 
Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time he said to John, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, the Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands, and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, he said to him, Follow me. Follow me. Follow me. Follow me. Amen. I want to thank the children of First Christian Church for that wonderful scripture reading, and thank you, Carol Wilson, for organizing and recording them reading the scripture. What a blessing. You know, for weeks now, we have seen John the Gospel writer's intentional attention to individuals who met Jesus, Nicodemus, a Samaritan woman, a man who was born blind, to Mary and Martha by the tomb of Lazarus, last week on Easter Sunday, two weeks ago now, to Mary Magdalene at the open tomb, and last week in John chapter 20, Jesus showed himself alive to his disciples a second time, this time to assure Thomas that he too was wanted, needed, and included in Christ's commission to be witnesses to his resurrection. And here in this final chapter of John, Jesus will once more focus in on an individual so that we can meet Jesus with him. Even you and me, even today, sometimes where we meet Jesus is right where we feel we have failed. In chapter 21, John names seven of Jesus' disciples who are hanging out together on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee, just over a week from Jesus' resurrection. We can almost feel their directionlessness and their confusion over what in the world they should do now. Peter finally says, I'm going fishing. The others say, okay, we'll come with you. These disciples go out and fish all night, but they catch nothing. At daybreak, there is a man on the shore. They're about 100 yards from the shore, but they see this one figure and hear his voice calling out, Hey, boys, have you caught anything? Nope, they answer. Jesus tells them to cast their net on the right side of the boat, and when they do, suddenly there are so many fish, the six, seven of them together can't pull that net up out of the water. One of the disciples says, it is the Lord. And at that, Simon Peter grabs up his shirt, dives into the water, and makes for the shore, swimming across to meet Jesus again. 
Others wrangle in the fish and then follow in the boat. Well, at the seashore, they find that Jesus has been busy cooking breakfast for them. Come on, he says, add some of your catch to my fish here and let's eat. I love John's wording right here. As Jesus is there by the charcoal fire, the fish are sizzling on the skillet or whatever he cooked with back then, and the disciples have gathered around, dumbstruck yet once more. John writes, none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew that it was the Lord. There is certainty. They knew it was the Lord. And there is question. Who are you? This mixture of certainty and question is what we call faith. Verse 14 tells us, This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Each of those three times also featured a personal connection with the risen Christ. Mary Magdalene at the tomb, courageous Thomas in a lockdown room, and now, whom? Carol and I got to stand on this very shoreline where Jesus met his disciples. Our tour leader and teacher, Dr. Wayne Stiles, explained that seven springs flowing into the Sea of Galilee near this spot on the northern shore create abundant algae in the water, which attracts abundant fish. It was a place Peter, the fisherman, would have known well. The primacy of Peter is the name of a small Franciscan chapel that was built here in 1933, but built over the remains of a church that dates back to the 4th century. That's the 300s. Tradition says the large rock enclosed by this chapel is the spot where Jesus cooked that breakfast. It is called Mensa Christi, the table of Christ. Somewhere along this northern shore, Jesus had called Peter to follow him three years earlier after another miraculous catch of fish. Listen to Luke's telling us in Luke 5, verse 1 to 11. Once while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret, still another name for the Sea of Galilee, and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Jesus got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked Simon to put out a little way from the shore. Then Jesus sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night long but have caught nothing. Yet if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw this, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching people. When they had brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed him. Maybe this explains why Peter so hastily dove into the water and swam ahead to Jesus. Well, let's get back to breakfast. John 21 verse 13 says, Jesus came and took the bread 
and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. Was this intended to remind these disciples of the time that Jesus had fed 5,000 on a hillside with a sack lunch of five loaves and two fish? Or was this to remind them of the more recent time Jesus broke bread with them, saying, as often as you do this, remember me. John, the gospel writer, is masterful at tying scenes together. Like that charcoal fire where Jesus is cooking in verse 9, the Greek phrase here for charcoal fire appears only one other time in the entire Bible. In John 18, verse 18, the charcoal fire in Caiaphas' courtyard where Peter three times denied even knowing Jesus. This bronze is in the courtyard of Caiaphas' house near Jerusalem. There in the high priest's courtyard, as Jesus was being abused with a mock trial and with physical violence, Peter had three times denied having any connection with Jesus. Aren't you one of his disciples? I am not, three times, and then the rooster crowed. And those three denials became Peter's self-identity. I am the one who denied even knowing Jesus. That's who I am. Wayne Stiles pointed out that every morning, Every time a rooster would crow, as roosters crow every morning, Peter would hear, and it would remind him of his deepest failure. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Simon, do you love me more than these. Now this alludes to Peter's boast back before the crucifixion when he implied loving Jesus more than all the other disciples. He said, even if I must die, I will never forsake you, Lord. Boasting that all, though all the others might desert Jesus, Peter would die before doing so. Now, a much humbler man after his bitter failure, Peter simply answered him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And in response, Jesus simply told Peter, Feed my lambs. A second identical question there by the fire, and, and a second identical answer, Yes, Lord, you know I love you, and then tend my sheep. At the third identical question, Peter felt hurt because Jesus asked a third time, Simon, do you love me? He answered sharply with embarrassment, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Well, then, Simon, feed my sheep. Three restorations for three denials. Three words of forgiveness. Three calls. Now, every morning's crowing rooster will be a reminder not of Peter's great failure, but of Jesus' great love and forgiveness. Verse 18 sounds ominous to us. Here's how you're going to die, Peter. But Jesus may have actually been encouraging him. Simon, you are still my disciple. I have much to accomplish through you and your love and your obedience to me. 
So don't worry, Simon, whether you will be able to stay true to me through the trials that are to come. You will remain faithful to the bitter end. No more rooster shame for Simon. Even Peter's death will glorify God. At verse 19, this beautiful scene ends and concludes just as Jesus' relationship with Peter had begun on this same shoreline. Follow me. What a wonderful way to conclude John's gospel. What a wonderful message from God to us, to you, to me. When we feel like we have failed, we are still in a place where we meet Jesus. Maybe at the place where we meet Jesus most authentically, most honestly. Nothing to hide behind, no veneer of goodness to hold up in hopes of impressing him. Nothing to say to him except, Lord, I know that I have failed you. I'm sure I will fail you again. And yet, Lord, you offer me food and fellowship and forgiveness and the same invitation you have extended from the first, backed by the same love with which you have always loved and always will. Do you love me? Then feed my sheep. Follow me. Let's start over. Right here. Right now. God wants to start over. As my friend Wayne says, instead of starting over with someone else when we've blown it, God wants to start over with us. Do you love me? Follow me? Aren't you glad we can? We hope you'll join us as we respond, singing a song that was written about 150 years ago. So at that time, it was a new song. Jesus calls us o'er the tumult. We gather together on that shore with our Lord Jesus, renewed, restored, forgiven, called. We unite our hearts together in prayer for those among us today whom we love and are concerned for and lift together into God's redeeming and gracious care. There is a list of prayer requests in the Friend, our church newsletter. You will find that this week. And please do lift those prayers up to the Lord each day. 
I remind us that Margaret Jane continues as a patient at On Point Rehab. And we share together as a church family in grief and sorrow over the passing of Bob Russell, who passed suddenly on April the 23rd. Our love and hearts go out to Vicki and her family. A private graveside service is pending. We all thank Bob for being the smile of greeting every Sunday morning, the laughter, the joy, and I believe for being the compass that always kept this church pointed in Christ's direction, outward, with an eye to serve and help in Jesus' name whether for the campers in Athens, Texas, for those affected by hurricanes in the Texas Gulf, wherever we needed to go, Bob led us there. We miss him. Would you join with me and let's pray. Oh God, as we hear again your call, we can hear the water lapping up onto the shoreline. We can hear the fire crackling over the charcoal. We can hear the fish sizzling above. We hear that great catch flopping in that boat and the disciples amazed, whispering and wondering. And in the light of your generous provision to each one of us, O oh God, we are overcome with our own sense of our shortcoming, our self-focus, our living each day as if we were what matters most. And yet, in the darkest places of our hearts and the starkest truth of who we are, we hear you asking, do you love me? Oh, yes, Lord. It is you who gave your life for us. It is you who have opened heaven's door it is you who have brought to us the redeeming, amazing, gracious love of our Creator God, unconditional, unearned, unmerited, offered with food, nourishment, and love to us. Yes, Lord, we love you. Help us now, each God, to hear your clear word. Follow me. Follow me. Come with me into this world where there is confusion and turmoil, where there is sickness and fear. Come with me into this world where some hunger and wonder where their next meal, their clothing, their provision will come. I have provided all that is needed. I am the God of abundance, and you can see the earth producing abundantly. Come alongside Bob Russell. Come along so many who move out in my name, in love, in service, and find your life renewed and restored in me. In these moments of worship, O oh God, we come. We come before your word and ask that it touch and change and renew us. We come before your table and ask simply to be fed once more as you fed them by the seaside. And we listen for your words of grace. We will hear them in our hearts. They are the loudest words echoing throughout the universe. Speak your love. Speak your desire. Speak your purpose, speak your forgiveness, speak your calling over us, O oh God. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, risen, living, calling. Help us to say, here I am, Lord. Amen. We come together today, all of us, here in God's temple with God. You are in God's temple wherever you are, wherever you are sitting, whatever you are sitting on, God is in your place. Worshiping is more than just being with God. Being a disciple is more than just worshiping. 
It is God doing God's work in this world. We give of our time, you and I as God's disciples. We give our skills and talents as God's disciples. As disciples, we give a portion of our earning to assist those in need in our city, country, and world. Our collection assists each of us, God's disciples, to do God's work. Join us as we prepare our hearts for sharing of communion by singing, Lord, you have come to the lake shore. I really do believe that today's text is one of my favorites of all the Gospels. 
And maybe it's just how I receive it, maybe some of you as well. But this is the point I was reflecting again this morning as Don was preaching. This is the point to me where the disciples really start to get it. And that's a strong statement for people that have walked alongside Jesus and seen miracles after miracles and teaching after teaching. Those that walked alongside Jesus in his earthly ministry. But there, once again on the lake shore, once again called to cast out nets, once again restored three times over that charcoal fire. Once again, as they broke bread together, they saw Christ. They saw that they were still called. They saw that Christ still wanted to use them. And that's the point. Comforting to me, and I suspect most of you, that need times over and over and over again to get it and to remember that they must have reflected back to that meal in the upper room and understood another little piece more fully that it was not a meal of one time, that Jesus washing their feet was not just a special occurrence for that room, it was to guide them from then on. Every time they gathered around table together, every time they joined with one another, even when they weren't together, as they went out and they did ministry and they gathered together and they remembered that moment. And Jesus was in the upper room with them. After the meal had been cleared away, he took the bread, he raised it, he asked God's blessings on it. He broke it and he said, this is my body given for you. And in the same way, he took that cup, that next sacred cup. He raised it, he asked God's blessings on it and he shared it with them in a relationship and love and said, this, this represents the new covenant in me of hope and forgiveness. That forgiveness that we see over and over again does not matter how many times we have denied, how many times we have failed, again, welcoming them back to the shore, restoring them over that fire, and us as well. This is the Lord's table and the Lord's invitation open to all. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. This is the Lord's table, and Christ invites you to share his meal. Christ recognizes you and looks upon you with favor. Christ befriends you and wants you near. Count yourself among Christ's disciples by partaking in this feast of fellowship. Amen. Gracious God, thank you for the bounty and blessings at your table. Thank you for the food that nourishes our body. Thank you for your teachings that nourish our mind. Send your spirit that we may work and live in a manner pleasing to you. Fill our hearts with love that we may love. Amen. Across different places and across different elements, no matter what your communion scene looks like this morning, we gather for this meal together as one in the spirit and in Christ's invitation. I do invite you, if you like, to rise and body your spirit where you are worshiping this morning as we say together as one body the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And indeed, thanks be to God, we continue to be called constantly, inward to God, outward to mission, and to bond with one another. As we make phone calls and check on each other, as we find ways to serve, and as we find ways to draw closer to God in new ways even. If you've never made a confession of Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you would like to talk more about this discipleship journey, please reach out to the church through a Facebook message or a phone call or an email. And for all of those that claim disciples of Christ, let us discern where we're being called to this week. God bless the decisions and responses made this morning. 
A few quick announcements. Our church facilities remain closed and activities here suspended through May the 22nd or until otherwise announced. Our ministers and support staff are available for phone calls Monday through Thursday. When the office is open, you may call the church number. Uh, please call during office hours and accept, excuse me, in case of emergencies or hospitalizations. We gather for, well, we join in prayer daily at noon, so please join us for a moment of prayer wherever you find yourself at noon each day. Our online Bible study continues. 7 p.m. on Wednesdays, we make the road by walking. You can join us by Zoom. There will be a connection in uh, our church newsletter or email Dana at firstchristianarlington.org. We also have a Bible study on Tuesday evenings at 7 p.m., led by Tiara and Serena. You can uh, find that Zoom, meet, Zoom announcement by meeting with them, emailing them. Our children and families have midweek meetup Thursday at 3.30 p.m. on Zoom. Contact Carol at firstchristianarlington.org. And now may God, who meets us at the shore, who feeds us from his table, who calls us to love and serve with the love with which God has loved us, send us forth in Christ's name as Christ's disciples, sharing the good news we know. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. Amen.